at the sky at night. Good evening. As I think many people know, there are problems with the Hubble Space Telescope, and they may well be connected with the main mirror, the 94-inch, or with its secondary. We don't yet know. Now, don't let's make too much of this. It does not mean that the telescope is a failure, and it should still tell us more than any Earth-based telescope can do. But undoubtedly, it is a serious problem, and we'll bring you more news as soon as we can. Do you remember the Giotto space probe, which went through Halley's Comet in 1986? Well, it's still under control, and although the camera is no longer working, other parts of the implementation are, and is going to be sent on to another comet. And there's very encouraging news of the Magellan space probe, now on its way to Venus. It will get there on August the 10th. It's not going to land. It will be put into a path around Venus, and, we hope, complete the radar mapping of the surface of that decidedly unwelcoming world. And then, um, what about Austin's comet? Since it was so disappointing, I hardly dare mention it. But we have got one very nice picture of it, a negative, sent to us by the European Southern Observatory. There's the comet, and notice that spike extending up into the top left-hand corner. And that's rather reminiscent of the spike of the famous Aaron Roland comet of April 1957, the subject of the very first Sky at Night program. It's not actually a reverse tail pointing sunward. It's merely due to a material in the comet's orbit being lit up by the sun. Now, I know that this program is called The Sky at Night. But sometimes we also have to talk about the sky by day, because after all, the sun is merely an ordinary star. And there's nothing odd about it, except that we happen to live on a world going round it. It is huge. It's big enough to swallow up more than a million globes, the volume of the Earth and it's also very hot. Even at the surface, the temperature is nearly 6,000 degrees centigrade, and in the sun's core, where the energy is being produced, the temperature rises to at least 14 million degrees, and possibly rather more than that. In point of fact, the sun isn't burning in the way of a coal fire. It's creating its energy by nuclear reactions, and as it shines, it's losing mass at the rate of 4 million tons every second. But uh, please don't get worried, there's plenty left, and the sun won't change much for several thousands of millions of years. Now, the surface is gaseous, and when you look at it, you can often see the darker patches known as sunspots, which are not really dark. They only appear so because they're about 2,000 degrees cooler than the surrounding surface. And this is a drawing of sunspots I made using my 5-inch refracting telescope on June the 28th. And you can see the sunspots there very clearly. But one thing I must stress straight away. I made that drawing with my telescope, but I did not look straight at the sun. If you do that, you're certain to focus the sun's light and heat onto your eye, and you'll burn your eye out and blind yourself. And that has happened. So what I did, a rather different kind of method. It's never safe to look at the sun through a telescope or binoculars, even if you use a dark filter. And the only safe method, as far as I can see, is one of a projection. And to say more about that, I am delighted to welcome, for the first but not, I hope, the last time, uh, Bruce Hardy, who is the director of the solar section of the British Astronomical Association. Bruce, like me, you own a five-inch refracting telescope. How do you go about observing sunspots? Well, Patrick, I use what is known as the projection method. This is by far the safest because you are not having your eye at the end of the telescope and looking at the sun. Uh, what I do, I mount a screen on the eyepiece end of the telescope. The screen is made so that it will revolve around the telescope tube. By revolving around the telescope tube, it enables me to correctly orientate the sun's image. Now, to do this, uh, I put a piece of graph paper on the screen with some east and west lines drawn onto it. I allow a spot, if one is visible, to actually drift across the east-west lines. That's by virtue of the Earth's rotation. That is right. And when the spot follows the line accurately across, I then know that I've correctly orientated uh, my telescope and the sun's image. Any sunspots that are visible, I then uh, record either by drawing them directly onto the graph paper or else taking them off onto another piece of paper. 
Well, it's been quite fruitful lately because, after all, the sun is, in some respects, a variable star. It goes through cycles of activity. Every 11 years, there are maxima with plenty of sunspots and sunspot groups. Then they go down to minimum. And we've just been going through a sunspot maximum with plenty of spots around. That is true, Patrick. And uh, what has happened is, as you can see that from the graph, that solar activity is very variable over the years. I mean, this one goes back to about 1610, and obviously in the early years there weren't many records. But you can see that where the re records are more reliable, the sunspot activity is very variable. The heights of the maxima differ, and also the length of the actual cycle does. Um, to illustrate this more clearly of cycle types, we've expanded the last three cycles. Um, and we see that cycle 20, which started in 1965, uh, probably falls into the low category. Cycle 21, which again started in 75, um, is a little bit bigger, and we think that's what, what we might call a medium type of cycle. Now, if we go right over to the right, and we see the line that we've drawn there, we find that that is a very steep, and it looks as though it may well uh, peak at much higher than the previous two cycles. So we would call this a high cycle. I think we're probably past maximum now, don't you? Yes, I would say that we are. Uh, it seems that the first maximum at least occurred in the latter part of 1989 because the spots now seem to be flattening off in the first three months of this year. Well, it's not only the numbers of spots that are affected by the solar cycle. It's where they appear. After all, they can't be permanent. You can't have a permanent feature on the gaseous disk. And at the start of a cycle, spot groups tend to appear in high solar latitudes. That's right, Patrick. In fact, this was well illustrated by E.W. Maunder, who drew what is known as the butterfly diagram. And you will see from this diagram that uh, the spots uh, tend to uh, take on the shapes of a butterfly's wings. The line across the centre is the solar equator. And you will notice that the first part of the cycle, as you say, the spots appear at 30 degrees north or south. As the cycle proceeds, they get nearer to the equator. At maximum, they're generally found around 15 degrees. And as the cycle comes to its end, you find they end up at about 5 degrees either side of the solar equator. But at that time, also, the spots of the new cycle are appearing again at a much higher, higher latitude. So the cycle starts all over again. It's also very important to remember that the sun has what we call differential rotation. In other words, it doesn't rotate in the way that a solid body would do, and the equator has a shorter rotation period than the rest of the disk. That is true, and that, that was discovered by Richard Carrington uh, uh, some time ago now. And uh, what happens really is that if you diagrammatically you put a line of spots on the disk, and then, owing to the differential rotation, the fact that the equator is travelling faster than the poles, the spots gradually tend to drift across the uh, disk. And you find that the, at the equator, spots take about 25 days to make one rotation, and at the poles, they're about 35. Now and, of course, is, spots are associated with magnetic phenomena. That's right. That is very important. I mean, uh, spots are manifestations of the sun's magnetic field. If you take an initial magnetic field of the sun, and you find that with differential rotation, the lines of force gradually get mixed up and drawn out as they proceed through the, with the gaseous layer uh, through the equator. And what they do, they get kinked and mixed and tangled together and break through the solar surface. Where they break through, they form sunspots, which are like the north and south poles of a toy magnet. And there's a very nice sunspot group with one north pole out here and one south. Did you take that picture, Bruce? Yes, that was taken with a five-inch refractor. It's a very nice one indeed. Yes, and that illustrates actually what sunspots are really like in the sense that they have a very dark umbra interior and they have what they call a filamentary outside, which is known as the pin umbra. And professionals also are very interested in the sun. And this was brought home to me a little while ago when I was over at the island of La Palma, the Canary Islands, where there is, of course, a major observatory, and we have our William Herschel telescope there. But there's another kind of telescope, too, set up by Sweden. It's the Swedish Solar Tower Telescope. And I asked Dr. Alf Kosovsky, one of the Swedish astronomers, if he'd tell me about the telescope. Yes, I would like to do that. We are now standing in one of the... Uh, observation rooms of the Swedish Solar Tower Telescope. The telescope is mounted on top of a 17 meter high tower and there on the top we, we have the entrance lens of the telescope and the light uh, from that lens is reflected by two mirrors uh, vertically down a tube and uh, I can now show you uh, 
one of the outlet ports of the telescope and here we have a image of the sun. We don't see the whole sun uh, and uh, there is a focus. You can just see a very small part of the sun and here you can see the solar limb and uh, here is a very big sunspot group on the sun where my finger is pointing now. In this way we can see the spots very well but of course the main work you're carrying out here is far more complex. Yes, uh, we have different auxiliary instruments and uh, using different types of uh, CCD cameras and spectrographs and we are mainly studying uh, dynamic phenomena in uh, the solar atmosphere and photosphere. And uh, the Sun uh, is our nearest star and uh, such uh, the only star at which you can uh, study in detail uh, uh, structures at the surface itself. And uh, by doing so you not only learn uh, what's going on on the Sun but also you learn about uh, uh, what is happening in uh, solar type stars. We can resolve the phenomena on the Sun uh, with a extension of about 100 kilometers which corresponds to a quarter of an arc second and uh, by taking out uh, uh, moments of very good seeing when the image quality is very good and uh, in, with, in different, uh, with different time lapse you can build up uh, movies and uh, so we speed up the actual happenings and uh, by doing that we can study in detail uh, dynamical uh, uh, things on the sun. We can see the flows of material in and out of the sunspots. Yes, uh, it's called Evershed flow, yes. You can see an in-moving in flow and also an outcoming flow from the sunspot. And uh, we also started the magnetic field, which uh, plays a fundamental role in uh, the activities of the sun. What about the velocities of the various parts of the sun's surface? The surface of the sun is boiling all the time and the velocities are about uh, five kilometers per second and the lifetime of those phenomena, those granules, are about five to ten minutes. Those are amazingly good views of the granules. What size are they? Uh, the size of the granules on the sun is about uh, 750 to 1,000 kilometers. What are the main facts you've learned from your studies here over the past two or three years? Well, uh, we have learned a lot uh, about uh, different uh, flows uh, in the atmosphere helical flows, vertices that forms and also we have better understanding of the coupling of the convection and movement with the magnetic field. Well those are amazing results. I was particularly impressed by the pictures of the granulations. What do you think of those Bruce? Oh yes Patrick, they were excellent and uh, as we've said and uh, the granulation plays a very great part in uh, what is happening on the surface and especially in the formation of sunspots. Uh, the columns of upwelling gas which form uh, and form the granules at the top um, are inhibited by magnetic fields and when the magnetic field inhibits the upwell of gas it means that it can't move horizontally properly across itself and so it cools and as it cools sunspots are thought to form at these boundaries and that's why a sunspot is dark it can be thought of as a magnetic refrigerator. Let's come on now to amateur drawings what do you think of them? Well, amateur drawings, if well done, are of great value. Um, here's an example uh, drawn by Harold Hill, right. and it shows the development of a spot group as it goes across the disk, and one can see the changes from day to day and the complicated structures of it. Do you remember that tremendous spot group of March 1989? Indeed, that was one of the biggest of the last cycle, and also Harold Hill has made a sketch of that. Uh, it was so big that at one time it would take 15 Earth diameters to straddle it. Well, if you want to draw sunspots, you can do so in the way you've described. Now, what about photographing them, Bruce? When you come to photographing sunspots, many amateurs have their own systems and pet ways of doing things. They use their own emulsions and uh, their own developers. Um, I, when I use them, I just use a normal camera on the end of my telescope. But I must issue a word of caution here, of course, that is that the single lens reflex, which is the one that is most used today and fits on nearly every telescope, uh, cannot be used to look directly at the sun through the viewfinder. Uh, it must have a proper filter set over the front of the telescope, otherwise it's just as dangerous as looking at naked eye spots with your eye at the eyepiece. Um, 
It, various photographs, of course, you can take of spots, and an example of the things that you can do are to record the faculty as well as the sunspots. Uh, you see the faculty are the very light uh, areas that stand out in this photograph near the limb. Uh, faculty are intimately associated with sunspots, and in fact they often appear before sunspots do, and after sunspots have disappeared, you can still see them. Uh, if you look on the eastern edge of the limb, you can see faculty coming around. And if you do, it's a very good indicator that you are going to see some sunspots. So far, we've been talking about things you can actually see in ordinary light. But I just turn now to the prominences, those masses of glowing hydrogen gas rising from the sun's surface that you can't actually see without special equipment. But amateurs can use that. That's right, Patrick. Today, amateurs have access to the hydrogen alpha narrowband filters. Uh, these filters just isolate a narrow line in the spectrum of hydrogen emission. And by using them, uh, it enables you to see the prominences. Here's an example by Eric Strach where he's used video techniques to uh, actually show this loop prominence on the edge of the sun. And you can see it's quite active and it has a very bright material and knots within its loop. Uh, prominences actually fall into two classes. They are quiescent and they are active. This happens to be an active one. And of course, you can also see prominences on the disc. Uh, again, with this photograph by Eric Strach, you can see that the very black, long-gated areas on there are actually prominences which are on the disc. They are then known as filaments. Well, but there are times when you can see prominences with the naked eye. And we have to wait for a total eclipse of the sun, when the moon passes right in front of the sun, and for a brief period, blots out the sun, sun's brilliant disk. And then you can see the sun's inner atmosphere, the corona, and the brilliant red prominences. I'm rather proud of that photograph that I took a few years ago from the Philippines. Well, there's going to be an eclipse on July the 22nd, but I'm afraid not from here. And the nearest place in which you can go to see it is Finland. And that shows the track going right through Helsinki and then right up into Russia. And that's where I'm going to be, or rather over it, in a Concorde aircraft. And I hope then to be able to take some pictures and show you those in our next programme. But a total eclipse of the sun is really a marvellous sight, and you've seen several, Bruce, haven't you? That's right, Patrick, and the corona that you see all around the sun at that time is very interesting because it also follows the phases of the solar cycle. Uh, in an example like this, you see that the corona is well established all the way around the sun, and that is characteristic of a high cycle. Uh, at times, also, you find that it also has great streamers within it, at this time and they're rather like the petals of a flower and extend for many solar diameters. At sunspot minimum however, and you can see at the, with this illustration on the left, the coronal streamers tend to be in the equatorial plane. If you compare it with the photograph on the right, you can see that at maximum activity the corona is well established all around the sun. Well the corona therefore at this coming eclipse should be more or less of the maximum type and we'll soon know. That's right. And, of course, if we're going to see a total eclipse from England, we've got to wait till the 11th of August, 1999, and then go to Cornwall. And I'm sure you're going to be there, Bruce, and I hope I am as well. Yeah. So you'll we'll have to wait for that one. Thank you very much indeed. And finally, our newsletter. It's now ready. If you want it, as usual, send your stamp to rest envelope to Newsletter Number 38, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London W127RJ. Or if you like, look at CFAX page 616. And when I come back next month, I hope to be able to show you pictures of that eclipse taken from the Concorde flying over Russia. And I'm also going to talk about a very exciting space probe due to be launched in several years' time to the ring planet Saturn and its remarkable moon Titan. And so, until next month, good night. <laughs>